business friendly policy framework. So, you know, uh, sort of this sort of uh, highlight the kind of things that we were all discussing yesterday. You know, infrastructure is important, but other things are important as well. We need to take care of the other things. So this is why uh, we want to show you. So how do we sort of integrate all these different facets together to try to make a successful uh, economic corridor development? As you listen to our experiences in South Asia today, uh, one key thing that is different is that most of our economic corridor development has been within a single country. We have not, I, I know that there was a very interesting uh, discussion yesterday, how do you do a economic corridor connecting uh, different, to, across two different countries. Uh, so, you know, but for most of South Asia, we have been doing single country economic corridor uh, development. So I should stop here because we want to get to the exciting part. So first, let's hear about ADB's SASEC approach and experience in economic corridor uh, development. So let me then uh, invite our ADB speaker, Mr. Somya Chadopadi, Senior Programs Officer at the India Resident Mission. He's been working for SASEC program for 11 years. He is doing big projects in India. $500 million for the development of industrial corridor, as well as studies on Northeast Economic Corridor and Industrial Park Rating System. So nobody who knows Economic Corridor better in South Asia than Mr. Sonia Chattapadi. Please come on up here. Thank you very much, Bernard, for a dramatic introduction. Of course, <laughs> after a dramatic introduction, it's very difficult to maintain the tempo. But let me uh, focus on the SASEC uh, approach and experience uh, in economic order development uh, in South Asia. I know down. Uh, I know down. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eileen? Ah, okay. So uh, today's agenda is that how ADB has uh, supported uh, to the regional initiatives uh, for industrial transformation and trade facilitation. As Bernard already pointed out, uh, the trade facilitation and economic corridor development, uh, they are the two operational priorities of the SASEC program. Uh, and uh, trade facilitation, of course, uh, is an old one. And economic corridor development uh, was added as an operational priority of SASEC in 2014. Uh, then uh, I will introduce the ECD. Uh, ECD uh, framework, uh, which we are following in different countries uh, in uh, South Asia, uh, mainly in India, uh, Bangladesh, and in Sri Lanka. And then defining the corridors and ADB's engagement uh, in India, Bangladesh, and uh, Sri Lanka. And then the uh, policy-based lending support uh, to government of India uh, for industrial corridor development at the national level. And then the lessons learned from the ADB's experience uh, in uh, different parts of uh, South Asia. It's moving, but moving slowly. So first, the ADB's journey to support the regional initiatives for industrial transformation and trade facilitation. So, so if you see this journey uh, plan, that in 2013, uh, ADB first got engaged with the uh, government of India when uh, ADB conceptualized uh, the East Coast Economic Corridor in India. Uh, spanning over four states uh, of India, 
on the east coast based on that uh, the study report then we started our individual uh, engagement in different corridors in india the first one was the vizag chennai industrial corridor on the east coast in the state of andhra pradesh in uh, india and uh, that was in 2014 when we started the upstream knowledge work the conceptual development plan and the comprehensive development plan followed by uh, the investment uh, loan and also uh, the policy based uh, support then we moved on to the second part of the ecc or east coast economic corridor that is chennai kanyakumari industrial corridor and simultaneously we started uh, work on the other parts of the corridor and some of the supporting uh, studies and upstream knowledge work the first one was the industrial park rating system that uh, we uh, started with the department of promotion of industry and internal trade of government of india we are fortunate that special secretary uh, ms uh, sumita dowra is here today uh, who is from dpiit and uh, india coastal shipping study that is also an important uh, intervention uh, for trade facilitation and connecting uh, india to the other parts of the sasak countries through the maritime routes and then we moved on to the logistic sector development in 2017 18 and based on our long standing partnership uh, with the logistics uh, uh, division of the dpiit then we came up uh, with a policy based lending support uh, to the dpiit in uh, 2022 and 2019 we got engaged in northeast economic corridor study and in 2018 we submitted uh, a sri lanka economic corridor study yesterday uh the representative from sri lanka mentioned about it that's uh, colombo to trincomalee uh, economic corridor and very recently about couple of weeks back uh we submitted uh, a report a released a report for the bangladesh economic corridor uh, study uh, which uh, was uh, released by our resident mission in dhaka but apart from the industrial corridor uh, development one of the main focus of the sasak program is of course uh, the several initiative to improve the trade facilitation and the logistics efficiency in the sub region which helps in industrial uh, development and also overall economic corridor development so adb developed uh, a trade facilitation strategic framework 2014 2018 which had four pillars customs modernization standards and conformity assessment assessment strengthening cross border facilities improvement through transport facilitation and institution and capacity building the aim of SAS, uh, adb support uh, to sasak countries is to increase the intra regional trade in south asia because that is a big challenge uh, in south asia as you know that south asia is considered as the least integrated region uh, globally because the intra regional trade is very low compared to the countries in asean or compared to the countries in the central asia eliminating barriers including the lengthy administrative procedures and unnecessary documentations required and coordinating harmonization of trade uh, regulations and establishing effective automation and streamlining the customs and security procedures and building efficient transit arrangements and strengthening cooperation between governments to create efficient and integrated border management arrangements including the single window system so in this regard some of the uh, key interventions that adb has made in this region is of course one is the bbi and mva that bangladesh bhutan india nepal motor vehicles agreement that was signed in 2015 although it is still not operational and uh, uh, eileen is here today uh, who was associated with this bbi and mva right from the beginning from 2014 and uh, mm, now we are negotiating the protocols under the bbi and mva to make it operational uh, in three countries namely bangladesh india and nepal because bhutan couldn't ratify the uh, agreement and that's why bhutan is not a part of the implementation uh, process apart from that we have also introduced uh, and supported the countries for technology driven solutions one of the key interventions which we made is the electronic cargo tracking system as you know nepal and bhutan they are the landlocked countries so they depend on the ports in india and also now in uh, bangladesh for their transit trade uh, movement so in uh, 2019 uh, 2018 we first supported a pilot for uh, use of electronic cargo tracking system on a rail based transit cargo movement from the port of bishakhapatnam on the east coast to india nepal border and based on our pilot then customs of both countries 
they come to an agreement and they operationalized this electronic cargo tracking system. And if you see the customs notification of both countries that acknowledges the ADB's contribution for that pilot of e ECTS. And that ECTS has now also been accepted as part of the bilateral arrangement between India and Bangladesh for the access to Chattogram and Mongla port in Bangladesh uh, for the use uh, from Indian uh, part. And also it can be extended to the other landlocked countries like uh, Nepal and uh, Bhutan. Another uh, um, uh, study which we have now uh, undertaken and which I'm uh, doing with India and Bangladesh is the cargo-based rail movement study between India and Bangladesh, where we are focusing on the modal shift from road to uh, rail. Because yesterday, a, a lot of uh, speakers, they focused on this part that how to reduce the carbon footprint and how to make it more uh, climate friendly. So one of the major aspects uh, also in South Asia is the road-based trade. The rail-based trade uh, between South Asian countries is really minimal. So how to ma make this modal shift and also possibly link to the other modes, namely Indian waterways or the coastal shipping to make it more climate friendly or more environment friendly. Moving on, the economic uh, corridor development framework that we have followed uh, in uh, South Asia, mainly in India, because our starting point was India from 2013. So first to have the uh, delineation of the corridor. Second is the identification of the nodes. Nodes uh, already uh, was identified or the defined uh, in yesterday's uh, discussion. And industry assessment, infrastructure assessment, and the regulatory and institutional uh, development. So ADB takes a cluster-based approach for the industrial corridor in India which is basically the geographic concentration or of similar or interrelated industries. And a cluster approach also enables firms to use common resource efficiency, generating externalities of lower cost and more innovations. A cluster approach of economic corridor development encompasses development of interconnected industrial clusters and agriculture centers, border centers, uh, the trade gateways and logistics gateways via multimodal transport linkages, and then the clusters and border uh, um, points, checkpoints, are to be interconnected or intraconnected through multimodal uh, transport network. So ADB followed a three-stage approach of corridor development, mainly in India, and we are following the same in Bangladesh and uh, Sri Lanka, that first the upstream knowledge work or introduce the concept, that conceptual or con comprehensive development plan, followed by a master plan of the selected nodes, and then the investment uh, program supported by some of the policy support. But as uh, it was pointed out yesterday, that many countries, they are in a hurry for the uh, growth. So they may not be able to wait for the completion of all the studies, all the master planning process before the actual investment flowed in. So what in India we have followed, that simultaneously when we are doing the studies, we identified some early bird projects which were already in the plan of, uh, of the national government or uh, in the plan of the state governments, and then uh, supported uh, those projects at the initial phase. And based on the master plan, then we kept on adding new projects, which will further strengthen the corridor development. So this integrated development of uh, industrial uh, transformation, it has also been explained uh, yesterday uh, in detail in uh, Pradeep's uh, presentation, we are also following the, almost the same pattern that industrial corridors are the key enablers for revitalizing the manufacturing sector. And industrial corridor development, we consider it as an effective policy instrument that integrate industry and transport infrastructure, urban services, and the institutional and regulatory regime to revitalize the manufacturing sector. And it involves creation of a seamless multimodal transport uh, network linking production centers, urban centers, and distribution gateways. So corridor development promotes synergies between the urbanization and industrialization in a particular geographical space as urban centers are not only serve as the major markets for the goods manufactured in uh, these industrial clusters, but also imported and act as the source of labor, uh, technology, knowledge, and innovation. So in this regard, yesterday there was a mention of cities as engines of growth, 
in India already, we have supported the Niti Aayog or the main think tank of government of India uh, to come up with a study on cities of engines of growth, where we identified that the, how the cities, they go beyond their municipal or the corporation limits and encompass the surrounding uh, places. And there we followed that uh, nightlight uh, mapping and then try to understand that how the surrounding areas or how the peripheries they are well integrated with the uh, core cities and how this kind of a coordinated development or a uh, coordinated planning can help for the development of the entire area. And based on that also, uh, now Government of India is thinking of considering area-based uh, development of some of these areas. So institutional and policy framework is also equally essential, in, uh, what we call the software part along with the hardware intervention. So key institutional and regulatory interventions that we have uh, done as part of uh, some of these uh, supports. Say for example, uh, we supported the government of Andhra Pradesh to come up with a new authority, Andhra Pradesh Industrial Corridor Development Authority. And that authority is a unified institutional mechanism for planning, development, operation, maintenance, management, and regulation of the industrial corridor. That means that many of these uh, work or the responsibilities of urban local bodies or the other local bodies, uh, energy or power department or the land allotment department, they are getting encompassed in one single authority so that the investor, potential investor, they can find it easy to deal with the government agency. And then uh, similarly in uh, Chennai Kannakumari Industrial Corridor, we have come up with a differentiated incentive package uh, for the nodes vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the other regions of the state. Because yesterday it was also mentioned that how to attract private investment and for that, what kind of interventions will be required and how ADB could possibly support. So this kind of a differentiated uh, incentive mechanism that we have come up uh, in uh, um, uh, um, Tamil Nadu for the CKIC or the Chennai Kanyakumari Industrial Corridor on the East Coast. Then we have also focused on the single window uh, system for the readiness of investment by improving ease of doing business, land policy, and then the investors' experiments on quality and affordability. So institutional arrangement that we have supported, you can see this knowledge work, the published knowledge work of ADB, the Scaling New Heights. It's based on uh, our study in VCIC. So defining the corridors and ADB's engagement uh, in India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, so as you can see that India is currently uh, planning to develop 11 industrial corridors in the country. Out of that, five are ongoing. The first one is the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, uh, which was uh, um, passed by the Union Cabinet or the Union Government in 2007 as the first industrial corridor, which was envisaged on the backbone of a dedicated freight corridor. So this dedicated freight corridor, Western dedicated freight corridor, it's supported by JICA from Delhi to Mumbai. So on the uh, that is um, uh, that can be considered as the spine of Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor, and there is another industrial corridor that is Amritsar Kolkata Industrial Corridor, for which the backbone is the Eastern Dedicated Freight Corridor, for which World Bank is providing uh, financial support to Government of India. Then we focused on the Visa Ch uh, Chennai Industrial Corridor and the ECC, the four parts of uh, East Coast Economic Corridor. Chennai, Kanakumari, uh, Vishakapatnam, Chennai, Odisha, and then West Bengal. And its significance is that it is moving beyond uh, to, uh, towards uh, Bangladesh and um, having a regional, uh, pronounced regional significance. And six are the upcoming ones. You can see the concentration of these uh, industrial corridors, mainly in the southern part of uh, India, uh, taking advantage of its proximity to the coastal region. So ADB's engagement in corridor development, if you see that I explained that first we started with the east coast of India, then we moved to uh, Colombo Trincomalee in uh, Sri Lanka, and also uh, in uh, Bangladesh, the Bangladesh uh, economic corridor, it has two parts from the uh, south uh, southwest, that is from Khulna to Dhaka, and then from Dhaka to the northeast, that is Silet. And going beyond Silet, ADB has come up with a new study of Northeast Economic Corridor Study, which is connecting South Asia towards Southeast Asia. So where the Northeast Economic Corridor uh, ends, that is 
on Imphal uh, uh, Mori border at India Myanmar border. From there, the trilateral highway is starting connecting India, uh, Myanmar, and Thailand. And uh, therefore, it has a tremendous significance to connect to the Southeast Asia. And also, it is supporting the government of India's active policy to connect uh, to the Asian economies. So in Vizak uh, Chennai Industrial uh, Corridor, if you see that uh, I have already explained that we have first done the conceptual development plan, followed by the master plan of the selected nodes. So here, two nodes were uh, selected, one in the north in Vishakapatnam and one in the south near Chennai. It's called Sri Kalahasti uh, um, uh, Chittur uh, node. And based on the master planning of these nodes, then we came up with the investment plan and also with the uh, policy-based support. So 125 million of policy-based support and about uh, 500 million of uh, ADB uh, investment project for uh, Vizek Chennai Industrial Corridor development. Similarly, in Chennai Kanakumari Industrial Corridor, we have identified six uh, nodes, but focus nodes are uh, located in the uh, south, which are highlighted here. And these two nodes are also catering to the backward region of uh, Tamil Nadu. So these uh, regions in the south are relatively backward compared to the uh, north northern region, uh, which is in and around the capital city of uh, Tamil Nadu, that is Chennai. So th the focus of industrial corridor development is also to uh, do some kind of a catching up exercise that how to focus on the underdeveloped uh, areas. And based on our uh, studies, then we have come up with the investment projects and now Currently, our engagement is uh, about 1.5 billion US dollar uh, in, uh, in the state of Tamil Nadu for development of Chennai Kanakumari Industrial Corridor. Third part of our engagement was uh, Odisha uh, Corridor. And Odisha Corridor, we have identified some of the, uh, some of the nodes and also then uh, did the master planning of the selected, uh, selected nodes. And based on our uh, support, to government of Odisha. Now Odisha is integrated with the National Industrial Corridor Development Program of Government of India, where Government of India provides some about 400 million uh, US dollars for the development of the activation zones of these nodes. The last part of the corridor development is West Bengal, where we are now currently doing an additional study. The first CDP was uh, given to the state government in 2020. And here, the significance of West Bengal is that West Bengal is at the confluence of two uh, corridors. One is that Amritsar Kolkata Industrial Corridor, and other is the East Coast Economic Corridor. And significance of West Bengal is its long border with Bangladesh, which has a tremendous cross-border uh, synergy and uh, significance. And in the north, up in the north, uh, it, it has the border with Nepal and Bhutan. So from this uh, point of view, the West Bengal Corridor has a tremendous regional significance from the Sussex point of view. In Northeast Economic Corridor also, we have uh, focused on three aspects. One is that how to uh, develop connectivity within the Northeast region, because Northeastern region, because of the geographical challenges that you know that it is uh, cut off from uh, the other parts of uh, India. Then the Northeast uh, to the neighboring countries uh, connectivity to mainly to the Southeast Asia and rest of South Asia to Nepal, uh, Bhutan and Bangladesh. And Northeast to rest of India connectivity through Bangladesh. And that aspect is very important where we have focused on the multimodal connectivity based on rail, based on Indian waterways uh, um, uh, transport, and also on coastal, sh uh, coastal shipping. Identification of the uh, sectors and the regional uh, value chain in uh, Bangladesh. So Bangladesh, we have uh, focused on uh, in, uh, this particular corridor. If you see that, what happened? Okay. So in Bangladesh, the mainly uh, the current production uh, network, they are focused uh, in and around the capital city of Dhaka or the main port city of Chattogram. So this particular corridor development will do the diversity that taking the production networks to the other uh, parts of Bangladesh, because Bangladesh, as you know, will be graduating soon in 2026 out of LDC status. And when it will be uh, graduating out of the LDC uh, status in 2026, then they will uh, get, uh, you know, they will lose some of the advantage of zero tariff 
that they are now in enjoying in other uh, markets so how to offset that because one another uh, you know i can uh, i should not say handicap but one more feature of bangladesh export is that 82% of their export earning comes from one uh, product that is a ready made garments so they are heavily dependent on ready made garments and that production center is uh, um, located in and around the capital city of dhaka so there are two challenges how to offset the possible uh, um, loss in terms of tariff and then how to diversify the products so through this interventions we are supporting uh, government of bangladesh to identify new areas of production new production network and also new products moving beyond their rng sector moving on the sri lanka one although this report was submitted in 2018 but after that uh, because of the covid and uh, the economic downturn in sri lanka we couldn't uh, start uh, the actual implementation of this economic uh, corridor development program but simultaneously we have focused on some of these other aspects and uh, under the sasec program we have done the sasec port connectivity the colombo port connectivity elevated highway to connect uh, to colombo port and those projects are also uh, supporting and helping the development of uh, this uh, um, economic corridor from colombo to trincomalee at the national level in india as i mentioned that we are doing a 500 million policy based uh, program and the first sub program uh, was approved in 2021 and the second sub program is going to board uh, in the q4 of this year and here our main focus is to provide uh, some of the reform agenda support the reform agenda of government of india and there are three aspects of this reform area one is the institutional structure and mechanisms of the industrial corridor development that is a unified structure connecting the central government with the states yesterday this uh, issue was discussed that how to connect uh, from uh, the federal level with the state or the provincial level so through this kind of a intervention uh, an institutional mechanism has been created where the central government or the federal government can seamlessly work with the state level entities or the special purpose vehicles second is the integrated and synchronized industrial nodes and enhanced financing solutions because financing solution is also very very important that moving beyond that when the government of india's fund uh, will be exhausted or when the government of india will ask the nodes to self finance that what will be the new financing mechanism for their uh, next phase of industrial corridor development and third is the ease of doing business so these three are the main uh, focus areas based on which we are providing uh, this policy based support to government of india so here uh, i can skip this slide it's the detail of uh, our investment uh, in india for uh, different industrial corridor development programs and also the supporting programs like the smile pbl or the logistics pbl and the msme cluster development but this one is important that what are the lessons uh, we have learned through our engagement so far in india because bangladesh and sri lanka we we have only uh, completed the study part so we haven't gone into the investment uh, part but here in india one is that need for a unified institutional mechanism for corridor development for the regulatory process that has been achieved to a large extent but still uh, there are some uh, loose ends which needs to be uh, tied up and that is very very important in a uh, federal country like india where there are several states which have uh, divergent demands which have divergent issues how to uh, really address those demand address those issues from the central government and how to make a seamless coordination between the federal government and the uh, state government through this institutional intervention second is the demand driven approach of corridor that as of now in india mostly what is happening is a supply driven uh, agenda that the government of india is pushing the states for the industrial corridor uh, development but the demand uh, should come uh, from the private sector and also from the state level and then what kind of industries and what kind of production networks um, should be developed and based on that what kind of transport and uh, logistics network or uh, policies uh, should be in place third is the need for the convergence of industry urban uh, transport logistics and skill sector and here um, i know uh, today a special secretary is here she will be making a detailed presentation on pm gatishakti so i will not focus on that but 
India has already taken a giant step forward for this kind of a convergence or integration of uh, industry, urban transport and logistics uh, and energy uh, sector and going beyond that, including the social sectors. Next is very important uh, and uh, which we uh, found in India that need for focus of the development of shorter industrial uh, corridor or make it more concentrated or focus instead of uh, you know trying to develop some kind of a 1500 to 1800 or 2000 kilometer long industrial corridor which is very very dispersed and where the effect of intervention both from government or from the multilateral development agencies or from the private sector they are very difficult to uh, really measure so there is a need for more concentrated approach and maybe development of shorter and smaller in industrial corridor where the visibility will be more pronounced and where the effect uh, will be uh, better compared to the uh, current industrial corridor development. And last but not the least is need to innovative financing plan because right now it's mostly the public sector uh, driven. Although in one of my previous slides, I have shown that because of this several industrial corridor development in India, Right now, the investment commitment from public and private sector taken together, it has reached about four trillion US dollar. But we need to uh, come up with the innovative financing where the private uh, sector financing will be more important for the future development of industrial corridor. So that was my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this comprehensive uh, summary of all ADB has uh, done in uh, South Asia. I hope there has been a useful learning experience. So after we have heard from ADB, now it's our turn to hear from the country. So first, we're going to have someone from the exotic mountain kingdom of Bhutan. So... Ms. Gaki Wanmo is a Senior Planning Officer of Bhutan's Department of Macro Fiscal and Development Finance. She manages relations with the Government of India, European Union and European Investment Bank. She also has served 12 years as member of the Gross National Happiness Commission. So uh, every one of you who wants to know more about Gross National Happiness, look out for her later during tea break. So... Please come out here and uh, tell us about Bhutan's uh, experience with economic corridor development. Yes, one more, please. That's okay. She already memorized the presentation, so she won't need any more. Stuff. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for this very grand remarks or introduction. Once again, a very good morning. So as such from Bhutan, like the presentation, presenter Mr. Somia has already presented that in the Sasek region, it's least integrated, but more focus within the country itself. So in Bhutan as such, we do not have any specific case to present here today but we are very keen to engage and collaborate and hear from our development partners like the ADB, if they have any new plans to formulate the project for the cross-border logistics <clears throat> in South Asia region. Also, I would like to highlight that while the presenter, Mr. Somia, has mentioned about the uh, motor vehicle agreement in the BBIN region. So Bhutan is still reviewing it and it's in the process of doing the public private consultations. So it will take some time. And in fact, if the public private consultations come out quite positive, we would be very keen to take up this initiative as well. So under SASEC, Bhutan is keen to take part in the cross border transport facilitation route initiatives or the studies along the Bangladesh-India-Bhutan trade route passing through the burinari changra bandan Jaigong fencing border crossing points. And also, <clears throat> Bhutan is also interested to implement the 
electronic cargo trading system for the transit bound goods. Mr. Somia has very well touched upon how this electronic cargo tracking system is, has been initiated and it's working in India and the Bangladesh region, but we would very much be keen to take part and take up this initiative as well. So with the government of India, the development of integrated customs checkpoint is under discussion. And this will be very important for us for ease of transport of goods and goods between the two countries, because I think all of us in this room knows that Bhutan is an import driven country and one of our main develop partner is in with India. So this would really ease the <clears throat> transportation of goods between the two countries. So since yesterday, we have been hearing a lot about coordination, communication within the country as well within the region. So I would like to touch upon, take this opportunity to again touch base that the need to conduct workshops like this forum, it's very much important so that there's a deeper understanding within the agencies, within the government, and also between the governments so that this economic corridor framework with a very good initiative and good frameworks put in place can actually materialize on the ground. So I would like to reiterate that communication and coordination is critical and we have to keep engaging like this so that people from all walks of life have similar understanding and take on board this great initiative. So the integrated approach of ECD as a new development in strategy for Bhutan can only synergize the development efforts in our country where the corridor may potentially be located. And also, as I mentioned yesterday, we are in an opportune time whereby, because we are right now in the formulation and finalization of the draft 13 five-year plan, where our approach is quite similar. We look at different clusters like the economic, social security, and the governance cluster. So an integrated approach and common understanding of this ECD can very well fit within the 13 five-year plan formulation strategy. So I once again would like to mention that this workshop or the conference has become very timely for us. And also in the 13th five-year plan, the overall objective of Bhutan is to become a developed nation by 2034 and only through such regional cooperation and taking up such initiatives, only we can be able to realize our goal of becoming a developed nation. So particularly coming to the SESEC initiatives in Bhutan, uh, <clears throat> prioritizing connectivity, both railways, roadways, and waterways is a very important and critical agenda for Bhutan, because as I mentioned yesterday, we do not have any railway connectivity, both domestically and outside Bhutan. So we would still want the development partners like the ADB to take forward where they have left, like with lots of initiatives, pre-feasibility studies have been done in the railway connectivity front. So we would like the development partners like the ADB to take forth that, that initiative. <clears throat> And also on the waterways, we have lots of protocols developed or MOU signed between Bangladesh and also with India. So we would like the ADB to take forth on these initiatives as well. So in a nutshell, I while I do not have a critical or case, uh, an ideal case to present here, but we would I would still like to re-emphasize on its importance in a coordinated manner. And also I have a question to the presenter that you have mentioned about the economic corridor development in India, specifically our interests would be in the West Bengal and the Northeast corridor development. So it seems like the, it seems like India, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka has 
reached an advanced stage. So taking advantage of our proximity to the Northeast Corridor and the West Bengal Corridor, where can, how can Bhutan tap on this advantage? Where is our entry point in this initiative? I would like to hear from the presenter. With this, if we have any specific questions, I would like to take up later, but I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, uh, Miss uh, One More, for Bhutan's uh, perspective. And thank you for giving us a tough question also. So uh, we have to work very hard so to answer that question. But, you know, let's all, you know, think about questions that we can ask because, you know, after we hear from them, I want to hear from you all, right? So hope that you all are, you know, engaging with the presentation, learning about South Asia experience and so of, uh, you know, ask questions later so that we can all learn from each other. Okay? So next up. Now we can talk later. Yeah. So next up, we can have a presentation from Miss Sumita Dora, Special Secretary for Logistics in India, Ministry of Commerce and Industry. And she is in charge of the implementation of you know, Prime Minister of India's flagship program, the called the PM Gati Shakti National Master Plan. She sort of hinted about it yesterday. I know that you have a special video. Should we play that first as an introduction? So, video on. So we have a trailer. She she got a trailer. You know, like when you go for this boxing or you know UFC MMA match. You know, there's a video. So let's let's have the video playing to introduce our next speaker. By Realizing the goal of a developed nation requires world class infrastructure and logistics ecosystem. Besides creating employment and robust health and education systems, thus infrastructure connectivity becomes a primary facilitator for socio-economic growth, led by our visionary Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi. This year's Union budget has announced a historic game explosion of US dollars 121 billion to be invested in infrastructure to facilitate multimodal connectivity across the nation connecting hinterland manufacturers to exit gateways, facilitating seamless movements of goods and people, and addressing last mile connectivity gaps. With these objectives at the core, the Government of India launched the PM Gandhi Shakti National Master Plan in October 2021 and introduced a transformational approach to integrated planning from multimodal infrastructure in the country. <laughs> आज पुरानी चुनौतियों को समाप्त करते हुए आगे बढ़ रहा है हम समस्याओं के स्थाई समाधान पर परमानेंट सॉल्यूशन पर जोर दे रहे हैं और इसका एक उदाहरण पीएम गति शक्ति नेशनल मास्टर प्लान भी है इन डिजिटल डेवलपमेंट ऑन द आत्मनिर्भर भारत एंड डिजिटल इंडिया the PM Gati Shakti National Master Plan is a GIS-enabled platform that adopts geospatial and other cutting-edge technologies and integrates multiple data layers of infrastructure on a single home. This brings various ministries and departments together and enables comprehensive and database planning for the country's development. A three-tier institutional system facilitates seamless coordination between line ministries and departments, states and union territories, and local level organizations, keeping up the spirit of cooperative federalism. 
This whole of government approach has resulted in the timely planning of projects in a cost efficient manner, reducing overlaps with existing infrastructure, minimizing ecological impacts, and reducing delays due to interdepartmental clearances. By improving the country's logistics efficiency in this manner, the PM Katishakti National Master Plan has the potential to save billions of dollars annually which can be utilized for public welfare schemes and various infrastructure projects. The BM Gadi Shakti National Master Plan had a positive impact, and some of the examples are regular NPG meetings are facilitating fast-track clearances from different authorities and de-risking investments. Stagion of 400-plus final location surveys by Ministry of Railways is an eight-fold jump from the previous year of manual surveys. Today, the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas completes detailed group survey within a day's time, as compared to six to nine months taken previously. Forest area intersection on the Pune Bengaluru Expressway has been reduced by 19%. More than US dollars, 17 million, have been saved in the alignment of Sinjab Jiribun Impal gas pipeline planned as part of the Northeast Gas Grid. The variety and scale of BM Gati Shakti National Master Plan impacted disaster management planning in Goa, efficient coastal corridor planning in Gujarat's Western Coast, objective decision-making for locating new schools in Punta Pradesh, efficient movement plan for carrying freight by coastal shipping, 4G coverage to 30,000 villages in the country. PM Kadi Shakti area development approach is revolutionizing India's planning for connectivity to both economic and social centers, thereby leading to balanced and sustainable socio-economic growth, and thus realizing our Prime Minister's goal of a developed nation by 2047. The enduring outcomes of the BM Gandhi Shakti National Master Plan are benefiting all stakeholders and citizens of the country. Reduced logistics costs are rendering the manufacturing sector more competitive, while fostering resilient supply chains and enhancing integration with global value chains. Thus upholding India's spirit of Vasudhaya Kutumbaka, the world is one value. Thank you very much. So that was a great video, and I hope we learned a lot. And of course, you know, India is right now in the spotlight, you know, about to host the G20 summit in, I think, two days' time. <laughs> so, so we are very lucky today to have uh, Miss Sumita Jara. You saw what she has to implement. That's a tough task. So let's ask her, you know, maybe she can share how she's doing, how she's doing this, how she's going to implement this very, uh, you know, ambitious and very, very important program. Please, Ms. Sumita. Thank you very much. Very good morning. And I'm very privileged to be here amongst all of you. The Lord. Okay. Um, the video has greatly helped in uh, putting across what is PM Gati Shakti National Master Plan. As you have noticed, it is a GIS enabled portal and the GIS data layers of the infrastructure assets, social sector assets of the government of India, various ministries, and also the state governments have been already integrated on this portal. Uh, I will not repeat what was already told in the video. I believe there would be some queries, uh, some clarifications probably. I will very quickly take you through very few slides. And uh, I would also like to uh, uh, showcase how this is a very good approach for SASEC to adopt and also for the SASEC countries to adopt in their own territories. Um, so my presentation will be briefer than 10 minutes. The video is already shown. As you have seen, uh, this is a tool, a planning tool, the PM Gati Shakti, for promoting comprehensive approach to planning, multimodality to the economic nodes, 
the industrial parks, the social sector institutions such as schools, hospitals, so on. And uh, it is an area-based approach that we are now looking at, a major infrastructure work, which is planned on the Gati Shakti and how the area around it is also planned through a transition plan consisting of various other works which are which could be looked after by the other departments of the government of India or the state. It is an approach to tra spatial transformation and you can see two parts to it, a GIS based platform where we've integrated more than 1400 GIS based data layers and there is an institutional mechanism uh, where there is an empowered group of secretaries at the government of India level headed by the senior most uh, bureaucrat, the cabinet secretary, the network planning group, which is chaired by me and the planning units of all the infrastructure ministries get together under the NPG uh, twice a month at least. And there's a technical support unit, which we need when we look at the uh, requirements of using such a portal. Uh, these are the pillars, and uh, as you can see, I've already mentioned quite a few of these. When we plan on the Gati Shakti uh, portal, we are able to visualize the data layers of the various other infrastructure ministries. So if you're planning a road, we can also see the forest area. We can see the railway lines. We can see where are the ports, the power lines, the telecom lines. We can plan better. We can see the intersections. We can identify the clearances required for a big infrastructure project. We can see where are the industrial parks and what are the last mile connectivity issues to these industrial parks, if any, and what are the other works which would be required to bring about comprehensive approach. So we are also able to prioritize works. Uh, a short while back, it was mentioned that this uh, infrastructure development has to be demand driven and that is how we are trying to bring a demand driven approach by prioritizing the works and by optimizing our approach and taking a spatial view of existing infrastructure without duplicating infrastructure without disrupting the forest area and reducing our carbon footprint and so on our achievements, we've already looked at more than 100 projects in Government of India, valued at around $72 billion in the last one and a half years. Uh, 200 plus state projects have been sanctioned, a total of 300 projects. So we have proof of concept with us. Uh, we have also looked at the critical infrastructure gaps in connectivity to the ports of the country. There's a comprehensive port connectivity plan whereby now, according to the gaps identified on the GIS portal, we are going ahead with sanctioning the last mile connectivity issues related to roads, railways, and so on. The government of India has also sanctioned uh, money funds for this year to take up these gap projects. And these gap projects will help us move bulk commodities such as steel, fertilizer, coal across the country. This is a slide which will give you a comparative picture before the NMP is the national master plan of Gati Shakti and after NMP is the, after we started using the Gati Shakti approach. You can see in pink uh, what happened before uh, we adopted the Gati Shakti approach. Uh, we took longer time, but now the time is reduced in preparing our project reports. Uh, we could not see the intersections. We had to do field surveys, manual surveys. Now, digitally, we are able to see these uh, intersections and plan better. Our NOC approvals are integrated by many of the states, and we are also going ahead integrating the clearances at the government of India level. Uh, we are able to see the land details, and we are able to plan better so that we don't lose time, months and years on end, in trying to get land from private parties and we are able to avoid uh, land which could be in litigation, try to use government land, try to use the land available, the right of way already available, for instance, for laying the natural gas pipeline along the ROW, which may be available along the road. Uh, social sector planning has taken uh, has been taken up, as you saw in the movie also, uh, the video we played in location of schools, in disaster management. Uh, very quickly, three examples. The Ministry of Railways has already planned more than 13,000 kilometers, and their final location survey has gone up eight times after using the Gati Shakti approach. The Road Transport Highways has also planned more than 7,000 kilometers, and they are doing project preparation in just 15 days' time. 
compared to six months earlier. Petroleum natural gas for each project, they need 46 reports pertaining to the terrain, the various other clearances. They used to take six to nine months of manual survey. Now it is done in a couple of hours with just one um, view of the Gati Shakti portal. Uh, I will show two examples. This is the regional connectivity. Uh, this was also shown by Soumya in some way. And you can see four countries here, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and there are parts of India, the Northeast. You can see the Ganges, the National Waterway 1, and on the right side, the Brahmaputra, National Waterway 2. And you can see the ports in blue. You can see 10 ports in India and 10 ports in Bangladesh, you can see in green. Uh, what is the purpose of showing this to you to demonstrate to you the multimodal visibility which is brought about by the Gati Shakti approach? You can see the roads which are connecting Nepal, for instance, uh, to Kolkata. And there is a major highway we've planned on Gati Shakti, the Indo-Nepal Haldia uh, uh, National Highway, which uh, will reduce the travel time from about 20 hours to 7 hours the connectivity between Nepal and Haldia port. And then we are also showing to you um, the movement of uh, goods from Bhutan. There are roads. I'm not able to show you here. Uh, you see, um, Swami, can you just uh, show the those road connectivity? Uh, or Yeah, you can see those um, uh, short lines just above the Brahmaputra. Uh, this is one connectivity which is coming from here and going to the Nepal border. That is a Rapsol to uh, yeah. national connectivity. So these and are the river, road links. River. And yeah. this is the river link. River link. And these are the ports. And all the way to uh, Chittagong port, there's a movement of uh, raw material from Bhutan to Bangladesh and consumables from Bangladesh to Bhutan. These are the railway line connections. And at Jogi Gopa, somewhere here, mm -hmm. we are. Yeah, yeah. Jogi Gopa, we are planning a multimodal logistics park, which will aggregate the goods and then we will be able to distribute them better through the waterways, the railways and the roads. And similarly, from West Bengal to Bangladesh, there is movement of uh, uh, fly ash, for instance, five and a half million tons of fly ash moves from Bang West Bengal to Bangladesh. So this entire multimodal approach which is brought together through easy visualization. Plus, you can see the connect, maritime connect from Kolkata port to Sitwe in Myanmar at the bottom. And also Kolkata to Chattogram, the Chittagong. Uh, you can see these maritime connections. And then the roads which are required and the railway lines that, that are required to bring multimodal connectivity. For example, from Sitwe. Yeah. The, the red road, the red part, the um, road to Palitwa, that is uh, identified as a road which is required and the one from there to Jorinpuri is the one which is under construction. So very quickly, I wanted to show you the multimodal approach which the Gati Shakti approach brings to regional planning. This is our concept of area development, bringing together both in, uh, connectivity to economic infrastructure and social infrastructure, uh, area-centric approach. This is uh, just a view of how we brought together uh, the area which produces minerals, the coal producing, steel producing areas, uh, the steel hub of India is here, the ports are here, connecting them to uh, roads and Already the roads are there, but they are overutilized. The railway line is over overutilized. We've planned a new railway line here to bring better modal uh, movement to all these commodities to the ports of the country and down to South India. So at a glance, this is the same Kalinga Nagar. Uh, you can see the summary on the right side. Left side, sorry how we are planning the multimodality, the connectivity to areas of tourist interest, social infra, economic areas of mining, last mile connectivity issues. These are the lessons we learned from uh, Gati Shakti approach for economic corridor development. 
a comprehensive approach, better regional connectivity, multimodality, a very uh, critical um, conceptual framework, which has been operationalized by us in India. And we are able to see the savings in time, in cost. And uh, we are able to integrate efforts across various ministries, which are undertaking infrastructure development, database decision-making, uh, we are also now looking at integrating artificial intelligence with the Gati Shakti portal, and we've had several meetings in this regard uh, with IT companies uh, so that we have a demand-based approach, a more demand-based approach to infrastructure planning. So I conclude here, and uh, we would be very happy to share this knowledge and uh, um, also to um, share our experience uh, if other SASIC countries would also like to adopt a similar approach to planning and very happy to also work with ADB for uh, using this approach for regional planning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Sumita Dara. Excellent, uh, very comprehensive. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited to see that there's, uh, you know, uh, extensive use of digital and data to make decision and planning. So I think that's a very important part of uh, of this uh, yeah. presentation, Gati Shakti, and how how we sort of should, should use more of this, you know, all this data that usually the government have, but not digitalized and put together in a format that is easily accessible by decision makers. So I think that's an important thing. Next, we have another distinguished speaker before us eagerly waiting to take his turn at the podium. Dr. Narayan Dakao is the Undersecretary of, at the International Economic Cooperation Coordination Division of Nepal's Ministry of Finance. He is in charge of uh, coordinating with development partners in the area of energy, irrigation, and labor sector, as well as the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation Global Monitoring Survey and Effectiveness Affairs in Nepal. Dr. Dakao, may I invite you up here on the podium so that you can share your presentation and your experiences with us. Dr. Dakao, please. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for introduction. And uh, my name is Narayan. Uh, so I I represent the Minister of Finance. So uh, let me briefly uh, take through some slides uh, <coughs> that are related to the Nepal's engagement in uh, regional cooperation and integration. So I was really you know spellbound to watch and to hear the uh, Sumida Special Secretary presentation. Uh, uh, and you know, we don't have to go far away to learn the next door, and we can learn a lot. And from the you know, the scale of the investment and the uh, their, I mean, a dedication and devotion towards you know uh, enhancing connectivity and regional cooperation. So Nepal has also as uh, uh, Gaki from Bhutan here. We don't have much to share the success story, but we have some engagement with the you know. SASIC uh, initiative. So uh, I just want to share some of the slides. I have many slides, but I will skip most of them. This is just our location. And uh, I start from the policy framework. Uh, but if you look at the policy uh, uh, framework, we are very much, you know, uh, uh, the policy framework very much favored for the uh, economic development and uh, <clears throat> regional cooperation and uh, integration. Uh, uh, starting from the concession at the upstream to the uh, the commercial policy and uh, Nepal trade uh, integration strategy, trade logistic policy and its action plan. And more than that, the international development cooperation policy because yeah. most of our initiatives based on the uh, international uh, cooperation and, and public private partnership act, investment acts and so on. So all these uh, 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 the framework uh, supports the uh, economic development. I don't want to uh, read out all these 
you know, words, starting from special economic zone, um, uh, domestic uh, connectivity, international connectivity, fast tracks, roll, rail wage, airports, what wage, um, road networks, knowledge-based economy, IT infrastructure, and whatnot. So everything we can find in our policy framework. So no problem with the you know, vision or long-term goals in regard to this uh, ECD. Actually, there are long list uh, of uh, SASIC projects in Nepal, ADB supported uh, and other development fund supported projects. But uh, uh, actually there are 25, near about 25 pro ongoing projects in place. But I pick some of the important projects. The first one is the East-West uh, Highway Improvement Project that focuses on upgrading the uh, uh, Nepal's East-West Highway, a vital trade route. Uh, to enhance the transportation efficiency and connectivity. The second is Kathmandu Valley Town uh, Development Project, which aimed at uh, improving the urban infrastructure and services in the Kathmandu Valley for enhancing uh, living conditions. The third is Power Transmission and Distribution Efficiency Enhancement Project. Uh, this is also you know, uh, aimed at uh, improving the reliability and efficiency of pa power transmission and distribution system for uh, reliable in uh, energy supply. SASIC road connectivity projects, which uh, aims at enhancing road connectivity in, in Nepal, particularly along the key trade routes uh, to promote trade and economic integration within the sub region. And, and the next is Nepal India Regional Trade and Transportation Project uh, that aims at improving cross border trade infrastructure, including customs point and trade facilitation measures uh, between Nepal and India. The World Bank also has uh, invested in this project. This is uh, Sasi Corridor 1 that uh, touch upon Nepal. So I just want to you know, show, I've taken it from the you know, ADB Sasi ASO website. This is the, the Kathmandu, Kolkata by Birgans route serves the key trade route for Nepal, linking with India. India is the largest trading partner and, and as well as with other countries passing through Kolkata and Visakha Patanam ports. Birgans is the major land customs, a gateway to Nepal from where 45% of the total trade cross this uh, custom points by road, wage, and uh, railways. And the another is uh, Sase Corridor 3. It also uh, serves say, the main uh, gateway for greater economic integration between Sase countries and uh, Southeast and East Asia. Within Sase, uh, the corridor serves to connect Bhutan and Eastern Nepal with India's East-West Corridor. <clears throat> Four, also, you know, uh, the, um, the, in, in part of Nepal, uh, the, the expansion of section of the east-west highway between Dalkebar and Patlaya is being financed by the Nepal government uh, with the World Bank support for bridge. And ADB is also financing a building this Kanchanpur Kamala section 87 kilometer to uh, four lanes road, uh, which commenced in uh, 2020. Uh, and detailed engineering for you know, upgrading Dalkebar Patlaya section is uh, underway. East-West Highway, uh, as you can see, it is a crucial transportation corridor that is spans the entire length of the country uh, from east to west. It connects major cities and towns and facilitates the movement of goods and services. The another is North-South Economic Corridors. You see the long brick you know, country, the East-West Highway, the length and North-West uh, you know, uh, all the way from the you know uh, high mountains to the plain uh, area, Tarai area. So the the upper picture, so the Kosi corridor, uh, uh, and uh, this also, um, uh, if you see that the, the uh, lower side picture, we we are facing the you know geographical difficult geographical terrain and um, the problems in you know constructing and maintaining the roads. So we have been exploring north south corridors also to improve the connectivity with the neighboring countries, uh, India and China. The project need to upgrade and expand networks, you know, in these directions. Oh. Okay. So this is, uh, I want to just uh, show as a, one of the successful, you know, uh, connectivity project in Nepal, which we call it Kali Gandaki Corridor. It is 435 meter 
a kilometer along the you know, bank of Kali Gendriki River, connecting India border, Sunoli to the Tibetan border, Kerala, connecting major industrial cities of Lumbini and Gandaki province, including Bhairava, Butwal, and others. Almost 1 million people of 10 districts directly benefit from this connectivity with uh, enjoying the reduced transportation cost and also help market linkage, investment, supply chain. The other is Kathmandu Valley Road expansion. So, uh, so being the economic and administrative hub of Nepal, uh, uh, this road has been, I mean, the expansion project ended the reducing uh, congestion and improving the transportation within the valley. There are some <coughs> other regional projects uh, uh, um, ongoing with support of the World Bank. Uh, I don't want to expand all, but just to name Nepal India Electricity Transmission and Trade Project, Nepal Second Rural Access Improvement Project, Nepal India Regional Connectivity Project, and Digital Nepal Acceleration is just uh, you know about to start um, in, to enhance the you know connectivity with the help of the, the ICT. Some other projects with regional implications. The one is uh, the BRI is also Nepal also signed MOU, but not it you know uh, um, materialized in real sense. Uh, that includes infrastructure development projects like railways and roads. This could uh, potentially enhance Nepal's connectivity with China and beyond. So currently, the, uh, the Trans Himalayan uh, corridor is designed, but not yet you know uh, started. Another uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation of the United States. This uh, was also signed in 2017, and just uh, 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 last month it uh, uh, the entry into force started. The uh, the clock started to count down of the five years project life. Uh, this uh, has also you know intention to construct. Uh, uh, 315 kilometer, 400 kilowatt <coughs> KV transmission line. Um, this is a cross-border trans transmission line connecting uh, major, uh, you know, backbone lines of Nepal to the India, and it is also expected to facilitate power trade uh, and also uh, supporting the uh, certain segment of uh, east-west highway uh, using um, uh, sustainable and environmental friendly, climate friendly technology as a pilot project. And cross-border uh, trade facilitation alongside the infrastructure development that have been enforced to streamline customs and trade procedures at border crossings to facilitate cross-border trade. Uh, <clears throat> the other initiatives to contribute to RCI, uh, Nepal is a, is a major, of, I mean, member of the various regional organizations, including SAR, BIMSTEC. So these platforms provide opportunities for Nepal uh, to engage with neighboring countries and uh, promote regional collaboration. And trade and transit agreements, Nepal has signed trade and transit agreement with India, and also transit and transport agreement with China. So these agreements aim to facilitate cross-border trade, transit, and uh, transportation, promoting economic connectivity and integration. Uh, and uh, motor vehicle agreement is also, you know, uh, under, I mean, way, not at finalized. And energy cooperation, uh, Nepal hydropower potential can be significant source of clean energy uh, for the region. Initiatives to export electricity to neighboring countries. Just uh, yesterday, Indian cabinet agreed to purchase 10,000 megawatt for 10 years. And, and it's a very good news. And, and uh, there are some other projects, Arun 3, Arun, Arun 4, uh, being operated by the private sector and exporting power to India. This is uh, the Dut Koshi hydropower project. And is in, in the pipeline, 635 megawatt, $2.2 billion cost, and a storage type project. And this is also this will also be the you know source of power trade and, and the, the planned transmission line um, will be the highway to evacuate the power. Similarly, the upper Arun uh, hydroelectric project is uh, uh, 1060 megawatt, $1.7 billion project. Uh, this is the semi storage, and this will also be the. This is also in the. I uh, mean, um, in the pipeline, and will be uh, um, helpful to enhance power trade with trade. So the positive note uh, I would uh, you know make here is uh, the RCI and ECD initiatives are being participated by all development partners. 
um, and um, it's, it's a very good harmonization among the developing partners. This is one positive note, I think. And the institutional framework in case of Nepal is also very sound. And the one success case uh, I, I missed to you know present in the above slide is the ECTS at Somia and uh, uh, I mean, uh, 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 Special Secretary Madam has also presented slightly. It's a success story in Nepal. Uh, it it uh, reduced the uh, um, uh, your uh, cost tremendously. Uh, approximately eight documents is to be required before the application of this system. Now zero documents is required. Similarly, twenty-two procedures and 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 signature. Uh, I mean, used to be you know. Required, but now zero. So it uh, reduced the you know, demerge charge and etc. This these things I want to highlight. And uh, thank you. Uh, I have well, I had one. Uh, oh, challenge didn't work forward. It skipped actually. The difficult geographical terrain and, and natural disaster very frequent uh, uh, recurrent uh, natural disaster is the problem. And, and geopolitical and security concerns and regu regulatory hurdles. This is a common issues. And infrastructure gap, financing gap, capacity constraints, these are also the issues. So uh, data sharing is also another issue. And the very small things, but uh, uh, I think the, we uh, can uh, identify new areas of common interest to enhance connectivity. Uh, for example, heritage and culture related connectivity through pilgrimage circuits projects. That it could have been ultimately converted into the economic uh, corridors in the long run. Thank you very much. Dr. Daka, so time is running short. So please, may I invite next uh, Mr. Udaya Nishanta Malawa Arashchi, Director of the Department of National Planning in Sri Lanka Ministry of Finance. He is responsible for reviewing policies and formulating development strategies and appraising project proposals in the areas of transport, highway, port, shipping, and aviation sector. So, Mr. Malawa Arachchi, please come up here and share with us uh, <clears throat> Sri Lanka's experience on economic corridor development. And uh, yeah, and you know, People in the audience, after this, I'm going to invite all the panelists, experts to sit up here so that you can ask us some questions. So get ready with your questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me to explain uh, Sri Lankan experience on EZD. Uh, you know that uh, Sri Lanka is an island nation. So uh, therefore, we we don't have direct connectivity with the neighboring countries. It will serve by uh, sea and air routes. Thank you. Actually, uh, Sri Lanka has uh, planned an ECD uh, called uh, Colombo Trincomalee Economic Corridor Development Project in 2018. With the support of uh, great support from the ADB, we did a study. Uh, it was a comprehensive study. So uh, it was um, actually that we are aiming at uh, private sector led uh, export oriented investments, minimize regional imbalances in the country job creation and uh, improvement of uh, productivity to connect with the uh, global and uh, global supply chain and value chains. Uh, actually, once we finished this study, Sri Lanka faced several challenges during the last five years. Because of that, we couldn't implement properly the Kalambu uh, Trinko ECD in a proper way. Uh, now we are facing a, a economic crisis. Some of the projects we planned for targeting this, uh, especially the infrastructure projects, we had to stop in the middle of the implementation. So anyway, I will I will little brief on this uh, project. 
This pilot economic corridor development initiative was focused on east-west corridor uh, that is expecting to get the advantages from the uh, Colombo port as well as the Trincomalee port. We have identified uh, several nodes for the developments. First phase, we have identified to develop the Colombo Kalutara, Gampaha, Trincomalee. These are the three nodes we have identified. At the second phases, there are other three nodes we have identified. Actually, I want to say that uh, the Colombo port is that uh, our main port serving for the basically the transshipments hub. The Trincomalee we considered as a uh, bulk cargo handling port. We have a road corridor also connecting both ports. We are now we are in the investment stage. Central Expressway project, we call it the Expressway project uh, connecting Trincomalee and Colombo. It's also a halfway done. And uh, railway connectivity is also there. It's already there. The influence area of, is a sp spread across nine districts and impacts 14.2 million of population, about 70% of the uh, total population and covers about 91% of the total industrial output of the country. According to the uh, according to the, that report, we according to the study, the corridor is about uh, 275 kilometers long, about six hours transit time at average speed of 45 kilometers per hour from Colombo to Trinco. So actually, uh, this will show you that how the investments are planned. And what are the uh, assets we are expecting to encompass? This. Central Express Corrid and Corridor Development and Port Access Elevated Express is some of the investments related to this uh, ECD. Actually, the Port Access Elevated Express is supported by the Sussex and it's almost completed and about to connect with the existing network with the Colombo port. As I said, that central exercise or, or still uh, halfway done, yet to be completed. And uh, we are focusing on industrial sectors and value-added industries. We are connecting one international uh, airport that called Bandar Bandaranak International Airport. We are continuously expansion in the process of expansion of its capacity. Now it's growing demand. As we said, uh, as I said, two uh, existing deep sea ports, Colombo and Trincomalee connected. And uh, these are connecting uh, key tourism, existing tourism locations with historic sites, wildlife parks, beaches and pleasure sites. Skill development potential. Also, we are looking at with this ECD investments. Trincomalee Port already declared as industrial park, and Trincomalee District declared as energy hub. Initially, we we looked at what the land lands are available, land availability of, along this corridor. So these are the numbers we have. Steps to identify development areas. We need to land use planning and land consolidation. Further, we need to establish institutional framework, investment promotion and facilitation, land area development, urban in infrastructure development along this corridor. These are the selected investment areas. Uh, after going through a selection criteria, two approach approach we followed. Traditional, we, we looked at what are the traditional strong sectors as well as the uh, areas where we can diversify. According to that, these are the areas we found that we can investments in the future. So 
these are the challenges we are facing now. One is that policy consistency and the political commitment. Time to time we see that there are different policies come up that is badly packed for the investment in Sri Lanka. So other issues are underdeveloped logistic infrastructure and providing quality infrastructure with the limited fiscal sets. As we already mentioned that we are facing a crisis, economic crisis. We have very limited fiscal space to provide funds for the infrastructure investments. Now we are looking at private sector investments towards the infrastructure also. Difficulties in establishing intelligence coordinations and set up, setting up an institutional framework. That is most important part to go forward with the economic corridor development. Trade agreements, we have already, we, we have some trade agreements, but we need further discussions with the bilateral to establish more trade agreements. Slow rate of digitalization process is also, is also badly impact for the, this effort. Less attention for the diversification of industrial base and export oriented investments. Those are the challenging areas for us to move forward. Actually, now we are in the process of many reforms within Sri Lankan economy in order to regain the de development momentum. We are planning a national development plan framework targeting 2048 with the four fillers. Under these are the areas we are looking at the reforms. So these are the areas we have found that export-oriented competitive, competitive economy, innocent drives, a single agency enabling to create a conducive environment for promoting investments and external trade, innocent-friendly environment, advancement of digital economy, and those are the areas we are looking for improvements. These are the key reforms area. I'll skip this slide. What is the way forward of ECD in Sri Lanka? Actually, we are suggesting to revisit the study already we have done in order to revalidate it uh, because we did it five years back. Now, many things has been happened during these five years. Now we are facing an economic crisis, we need to readjust it and re-strategizing it to go forward. And then prepare a master plan which includes prioritized project pipeline, a formalized industry, institutional structure for coordination and management with resource mobilization plan. This is more important because we need to identify what are the resources we can get and we need to map out Clearly, legal and institutional framework articulated with good governance framework is more important. Time-bound specific project development design, phase out implementation with clear financing investment plan targeting FDIs. And then well-developed communication plan targeting to obtain political commitments, stakeholder support and support of general public. This is very important for us because during the past few years, we have bad experience on the misleading information surrounding the, with the general public. So because of that, from the beginning, we should have a proper communication plan to address all these areas prior to implementation. But anyway, still we are investing on some other infrastructure already in place, especially the Colombo port and the airport. We are investing continuously, increasing the, its capacity. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much uh, for sharing this uh, update. Um, let me invite all. I know that uh, we are, you know, uh, it's, it's time for the tea break, but I would like to invite 
uh, all our experts, panelists to come up here uh, so that we can uh, answer some questions from the panelists, uh, from the audience. So please. And actually more important than answering the question is because Pia uh, will not forgive me if we don't have a picture of all the panelists from SASEC together. So this is under strict orders from Pia. Please come up here. And uh, for your audience, please, uh, any questions that you would like to ask from our, uh, our you know, uh, panel of uh, South Asian uh, countries' experience? Uh, so, uh, please, thank you. And, uh, but, you know, while we are waiting for you to formulate your question, Maybe Somia can actually answer the question that Bhutan asked a bit earlier. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bernard. So uh, Bhutan's question was that how uh, this corridor development in India, especially the corridor development in the Northeast region of India and also in West Bengal, uh, they are connected to Bhutan and what would be the starting point and uh, what are the areas that can be developed. So in Northeast Economic Corridor Study, we have already mapped those connectivity uh, to the broader crossing point uh, with Bhutan between the Northeast part of India and Bhutan. So um, also there is a transit trade route, uh, future transit trade route between Bangladesh, India and Bhutan to the Northeast. So it is entering um, India at a place called Dalu from uh, Bangladesh in the state of Meghalaya. And then moving to uh, uh, Jogi Kofa Multimodal and Logistics Park, which was mentioned by uh, Special Secretary. And then moving towards Bhutan border, it's called the place called Gelefu. So the Gelefu is also planned as uh, an industrial estate uh, to be developed with support from Government of India. And also uh, an airport has been planned uh, in Gelefu. So along with the uh, border crossing point or the land custom station, and uh, the airport and also the industrial uh, park which is being developed with government of india's support in bhutan there will be a perfect synergy between the bhutan's industrial uh, development and the northeast economic corridor so that will be the starting point that from bhutan those goods already some of the raw materials they are coming from bhutan going to bangladesh following this route and what uh, special secretary uh, ma'am has already pointed out that the aggregation point will be Jogi Gofa and from there it will follow the multimodal uh, transport route that both the inland waterways and the railway uh, routes will be available from Jogi Gofa up to Jogi Gofa it will be the road connectivity and from Jogi Gofa it can follow the India Bangladesh protocol route to get access to Mongla and uh, Chattogram port and also it can take the railway uh, uh, route to go to the ports uh, in Kolkata and Haldia located in the state of West Bengal. So that is one part. And second part is you have also briefly pointed out that the West Bengal connectivity, there is a place called Hasimara, which is about 18 kilometers from Bhutan border, which is the um, last railhead uh, between India and uh, Bhutan. And Bangladesh is also very keen uh, to have uh, this access extended from Bangladesh side, Purimari and Changrabanda and moving up north to uh, Funshling uh, through Hasimara. So that will possibly be another transit trade route between Bhutan, India, and Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Somya. Uh, it's very clear that you've been reading Atlas since you were a young kid. I do not know half the place that you mentioned, but I trust they were there. <laughs> Recently, you facilitated the travel of Bhutanese uh, delegation uh, to all these places. Thank you. So, any come on, let's let's hear something from our participant. Yes, from Tajikistan. Yes. Thank you uh, for presentation and uh, Sasek uh, uh, corridor is a uh, uh, very ambitious plan uh, and. Uh, I see that uh, in this plan, uh, uh, <clears throat> it's planned to uh, build industrial parts, uh, to build machineries, equipments, uh, laptops, and so so on, uh, and also use uh, uh, art 
uh, artificial intelligence uh, in, log uh, in logistic centers. Uh, some practice shows that uh, in these plans, uh, uh, in the uh, future, we, we face uh, with two problems. Problem is uh, human capital and competitiveness of uh, goods and services. And uh, my question to all of uh, panelists, uh, how uh, can you plan to solve this problem? Thank you very much. Uh, so two questions we face here. How do we handle the issue of human capital and how do we ensure uh, competitiveness? So anyone would like to volunteer? Uh, right. Uh, so uh, what I presented uh, under the Gati Shakti approach, uh, it's very important to uh, build the capacities of the people who are planning multimodality and planning to have a more efficient logistics ecosystem. So uh, we have uh, focused equally on capacity building in the ministries of government of India and also with the state governments. It is an ongoing effort. And uh, I can confidently say today that at government of India, we have uh, showcased a number of cases where which evidence the capacities which have been built in every ministry which has a cell for planning multimodal connectivity on the Gati Shakti portal. And uh, there are nodal officers in all the ministries. In the state governments also, we have institutional mechanisms which are established. Of course, some of the states are doing better and others are also learning from them. Uh, now we are at the point, at the cusp of taking Gati Shakti uh, up to the district level, which will require much more capacity building and we are working on that. And when you come to the other aspect of competitiveness, uh, logistics is a very important part of uh, being competitive globally. And in India, we have the Make in India initiative, which has been going on since some years now, uh, to uh, uh, have uh, India as the manufacturing hub uh, for not just the country, but also for the world. And we have recently launched some more very ambitious incentive programs to support building uh, global champions in manufacturing. In all this, logistics is a very important cost. And to be globally competitive, how efficient we are in the seamless movement of goods, not just the hard infrastructure, but also the services, the soft aware, which we have been talking about, uh, how do the uh, policies, how do the custom uh, processes, the handling in the freight stations at the integrated check post, whether it is moving by land border or by the sea route. We are working on making all this efficient through institutional mechanism, which we call the services improvement group, which is under our logistics policy. So in this manner, we are looking at uh, both capacity building and becoming more competitive where our manufacturing services are concerned by making our logistics cost lower and meeting global benchmarks by 2030. We want to be in the top 25 nations in the world with respect to logistics performance index. Thank you. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Uh, any other comments? Uh, yes, gentlemen from Kara Institute, please. Thank you so much for uh, excellent presentation. My question is about the uh, understanding the level of the uh, digital connectivity in the Sasek region. Uh, I can see uh, lots of uh, great uh, corridors that has been mentioned there, but my experience from the Karek region, uh, we've been just to give you an example of the electronic SPS certification. Uh, currently, uh, we've been trying here in the Karek region to establish the electronic SPS certification, uh, but still we are uh, lagging there in the proper implementations, except one and two countries. So just to make this whole economic corridor development more sustainable, uh, and especially in the peripheries, right, uh, with bordering with Bhutan and bordering with Bangladesh. So my question is that um, what's the level of those kind of understanding uh, in the Sasek region. 
And my follow-up question is about the, uh, again, uh, to, to understand it, where the Sussex region has been standing in terms of the uh, digital payments across the borders. And again, this is something we've been trying here in the Carrick region uh, to see it's at least the level of uh, the standing of the Carrick member countries. So my question, uh, first one is about to see again where the Sussex region has been standing in terms of this digital connectivity, and especially one of the important components that I mentioned about the SPS certifications, because like mostly in the Carrick region has been manual yet, right? Uh, and then the second question is about, is there any initiatives about the digital payments so that we can make this new economic corridor framework more sustainable? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Somya. Uh, okay. So uh, on the first part, uh, you know, um, yes, I agree that the digital connectivity in Sussex region is a, a big challenge. But uh, what you mentioned about the SPS certification and others, now, under uh, the SASEC uh, Trade Facilitation Strategic Framework, we are focusing on harmonization and integration of the electronic uh, um, system of different uh, countries of the SASEC. So when we are uh, supporting the countries for the development of national single window, there we are also focusing on the harmonization part. And already uh, under the SASEC initiative, we have done some studies on SPS TBT. And there, this certification, the digital certification and other parts, they have also been uh, touched upon. And there, uh, we are um, trying to support these uh, countries to upgrade their system first. Because unless and until their systems are upgraded, because India has already developed uh, custom systems called IceGate. And through that IceGate, uh, that kind of uh, um, uh, you know, uh, customs auto automation is possible. But the other countries, they are doing some kind of a catching up exercise. And there, the ADB's role through the SASEC is to how to harmonize uh, their system. So as part of that, we are trying to build that kind of a coordinated mechanism uh, within the uh, um, SASEC region. And second is that uh, digital payment. Of course, India is a, a pioneer uh, on that. And I think uh, um, through this G20 initiatives also, India is uh, trying to expand uh, um, its network of digital payment, which includes the uh, neighboring countries, but I think Special Secretary Ma'am uh, may like to uh, mention something more about this part. Uh, I would like to mention two initiatives uh, when it comes to digital interventions for easing uh, logistics and regional connectivity. Uh, India is a big country, as you know, and uh, we have successfully used the Unified Logistics Interface Platform, which brings together digital interventions to make logistics easier, to bring about ease of logistics. We call it ULIP for short. It is a single window for transactions related to logistics, uh, single sign-on. So logistics related businesses who want to get documents authenticated, who want to apply for various clearances, whether it is on IceGate, which is the custom related platform, or it is to track the movement of their containers on the railway system, or to track the movement of their cargo on the roads, the integration of the toll gates, or it is about uh, uh, bringing in the uh, you know um, authentication of documents about uh, uh, the transport operators they are using. All this is integrated, unified on the ULIP, Unified Logistics Interface Platform. And it is also integrated with digital payments. Uh, so that uh, makes it easier for the logistics related businesses to uh, undertake various transactions and uh, uh, digital interventions when it comes to ease of logistics. Uh, so this is one example and uh, we have brought together the uh, portals of the various ministries that look at logistics to make this possible. Uh, ULIP is uh, now uh, being actively used by various businesses and applications are being developed on the platform. Number two, I want to mention the logistics data bank. We have the National Logistics Data Bank Limited, which is an SPV we have with a Japanese company. Uh, that traces the container movement of all export and import related containers. 
100% exim related containers in the country are tracked, traced. We can see the speed analysis, the traffic congestion, the handling at the ports, the dwell time of the containers at the ports, and that is how we are improving the efficiency at the ports in the country. And the logistics data bank has brought down India's dwell time uh, in the world, and we are uh, we have a dwell time which is lower than UAE, Singapore, uh, Germany, and US as per the World Bank report 2023 on LPI. So we would be very happy to share both these digital interventions which we are doing in the country to bring down uh, the you know to improve the ease of logistics and uh, also to bring about digital digitization of the various uh, logistics related interventions. Thank you very much. Anything you want to add? Just want to add, uh, add on the, uh, the digital payment part. Nepal also, you know, uh, implementing the Asikuda systems, automated custom systems, and allows uh, digital payment for the custom invoices. Just thank you. So if I may share some experience from Bhutan, I totally agree with you that digital connectivity is a challenge and it's definitely so for a landlocked country like Bhutan. So in order to, well, we'll not be able to totally overcome this challenge, but some of the measures or counters that Bhutan has taken into account is up until now, lots of agencies have been coming up with their silo, initiatives like coming up with their own electronic systems and all so a major transformation initiative is underway in Bhutan currently and with this we have come up with the gov government technology agency who is mandated to look at all of this so that we have a uniform or a, a coordinated approach towards all this digital Specs. And also in the, we are currently in the 12th five-year plan and we have taken up a digital Trucule flagship program. We have series of around five to six flagship programs and recognizing the importance of digital digitalization it has been identified as one of the flagship programs so that all these different electronic systems are brought under one so with this initiative, we have come up with lots of e-systems, one being the Bhutan Integrated Tax System. We have the Electronic Patient Information System and so forth and so on and so forth. So these are some of the initiatives that Bhutan has taken into account. Uh, very quickly, I'd like to also mention the useful studies done by ADB in three major ports of India at uh, Chennai, JNPT, Mumbai, and also at Akapatnam, where they've helped us see uh, the areas where there is uh, uh, use of physical documentation, duplication of documents. And we are trying to, we have actually already improved quite a bit because the study was done about two, three years back, but that's been a very important uh, indicator for us on how we are going ahead. Yeah, uh, Sri Lanka also in the same uh, process. Uh, we, our main target is also uh, to uh, improve the digital connectivity and the digital payment system. So uh, we are in the process of designing the uh, single window system for the custom as well as the port community system for the uh, for, uh, Sri Lanka Port Authority. Uh, so our system is already in place. Thank you. And I know that we are terribly late. I also note that we have a question with Uzbekistan. So let's hear from Uzbekistan, then you all, we can all go. Please. Uh, thanks so much for a very interesting presentation for all speakers. And I have only two questions very shortly. And for all speakers, question. What kind of legal, financial, and uh, insurance and other mechanism have been used uh, to attract private investment and private business to economic corridor project. It's one for all. 
speakers. And secondly, what projects have attracted $500 million of ADB loan in India for development of economic corridor? Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, Somia, you can... Uh... So in my presentation, I uh, briefly pointed out that uh, how this institutional and finan uh, financing mechanism has been developed by India in terms of uh, developing a national industrial corridor development uh, implementation trust, NICDIT. And this NICDIT is uh, the mechanism through which all these individual uh, nodes or the projects are apprised and then recommended uh, to the government of India uh, for financing. And when the government of India approves, then uh, the finance flows into the individual industrial nodes or the projects. It is approximately uh, 400 million uh, per nodes. Uh, that's the government of India's uh, support, which flows into uh, um, the uh, nodes, industrial nodes. And to support this NICDIT, uh, there is an institu another institution which has been created that is called NICDCL, that is National Industrial Corridor Development Corporation Limited which is uh, the knowledge partner of all these industrial nodes. So on one hand, the financing is coming uh, through NIC DIT's appraisal mechanism and NIC DCL is the knowledge partner to prepare the master plan and other related plans like safeguards and uh, other uh, documents.